We talked about how Ramadan is a month that has to be sought. Iman and wahtisaba. The reward are for those who do it out of a sense of faith and who are also seeking an increase in reward. And the way in which that anticipation is expressed was through dua. The Prophet and the Sahaba, they used to pray about the month of Ramadan months before. In many cases, they would complete one Ramadan and they would start praying for the next Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Oh Allah, allow us to reach that month of Ramadan. And yet, despite this sense of anticipation, somehow, every year we lose track of time. We somehow suddenly trip on the month of Ramadan. We're like, how did it happen? It's been a whole year. You know, it feels like we weren't expecting it. And I mean, especially with COVID, we definitely didn't feel that a whole year has passed. And for many people, we approach it with trepidation. Um, how is this Ramadan going to work? Am I going to be able to get inside ICCP? Are we going to be able to get tickets? Are we going to be able to socialize and have iftars the way that we used to do? Um, and obviously this year, there's going to be more planning. The approach is going to be completely different from in the past. Um, in many cases, the old approach, the one that's so familiar, the one that brings up these feelings of nostalgia, um, was passing the day with work or school. Then we'd have Salat al-Taraweeh in the evening, socialize at night. And one day would turn into two, two days would turn into four, four days would turn into a week. And before we knew it, in the blink of an eye, the month of Ramadan was over. So I wanna invite myself and all of you to, to ask this question. Has the old approach been conducive to transformation and growth? Because the month of Ramadan is absolutely a period as Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali described, it is a season of worship that Allah has made certain times and certain days and certain years and certain times within the day more special than others. Not because they're intrinsically more valuable, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned them a greater value as an opportunity for the servant to be more optimistic and be more hopeful, all right? And so uh, as, as uh, Sister Senda mentioned, you know, that being deprived of something makes us appreciate its value even more, all right? And that itself is, is actually one of the keys and one of the formulas of success. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that we related last week, man hurima khayraha faqad hurim, right? Whoever is deprived of the good of this month is completely destitute. That person has missed out on something that is irreplaceable. So that feeling of anticipation, that feeling of excitement is actually the fuel that's gonna allow us to get through the month of Ramadan. But first we have to be a little bit introspective. Has, have the old ways been conducive to transformation? How many years have we been fasting? For some of our youth, maybe five, six years, for others, 10, 15, maybe 40 years, maybe more than that. Are we 10, 15, 40 times better? Are we on a positive trajectory? Or are we reinventing the wheel every time the month of Ramadan starts? All right, so we start the month of Ramadan and we're like, oh, we get to do this all over again. And the reality is in, in some cases, we're not actually getting all of the benefits from the month of Ramadan. All right, so Abu Huraira he related, that the Prophet ﷺ said, there may be people who fast and get nothing from their fasting except for hunger. And there may be people who pray Qiyam, who stand in the prayer in the night and get nothing from their Qiyam except for a sleepless night. I think this is very important because many of us view the worship itself as the goal. So we'll do dhikr and we'll say, okay, I said subhanAllah 100 times. And we'll consider that that number or that remembrance is the goal itself. Or I completed these prayers or I went for hajj or whatever the case might be. And we think that act of worship is the goal. It's something discrete, something that we can check off of a box. But in reality, these acts of worship are but the means they're a way in order to achieve Allah's pleasure and satisfaction from us. 
They're not the actual goal. The goal is to actually have that action accepted and for it to be rewarded. And let's see what the Prophet ﷺ used to do because that is our perfect example in terms of how to behave and what to do in the month of Ramadan. And we have the example that's described in the famous book, Zad al-Ma'ad. Uh, this is the book of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. And he describes how the Prophet ﷺ would intensify his worship. But we're not just going for quantity, we're going for the quality as well. So he said, and this is the translation of what he wrote in his book. He said from his Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's blessed guidance in Ramadan is that he used to intensify and diversify. Intensify and diversify his acts of worship. So for example, Jibreel used to rehearse the Quran with him during the nights of Ramadan. When Jibreel would visit him, as a result, he would intensify the amount of sadaqah that he would give. And I know even though it's not mentioned that Ibn Qayyim is getting this from the beautiful hadith of Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How she said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kana ajwad nas He was the most generous of all people. Wa ajwadu ma yakun fi shahr Ramadan. And the most generous that he would be would be during the month of Ramadan when he used to yatadaras al-Qur'an. He used to rehearse the Qur'an and review the Qur'an with Jibreel when he used to come to him. And then she would say in that hadith that during the month of Ramadan, he was karriyah al-mursala. He was like the free flowing wind. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he describes that he was the most generous of all people and Ramadan was the time in which he was the most generous. He would fill his time with sadaqah, with charity, treating people kindly, reciting Quran, performing salah, remembering Allah, and performing artikaf, seclusion in the masjid. I want to point out one thing. Aisha could have chosen a hundred ways to describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, Jude is one of the most beautiful ways of describing generosity, right? Allah is al-jawad. He is the most generous and the most giving. But she described the blessed, the, the cooling wind. Because that free-flowing wind, al-rih al-mursala, is something that brings joy and coolness to everybody. No one is denied its blessing. No one is discriminated against. And also, al-rih al-mursala, is not lazy or negligent in bringing goodness to the people. It comes swiftly to all people. So this is a beautiful metaphor of the generosity and the giving nature of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we combine all of these attributes together, we realize that the Ramadan of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a spiritual side. Yes, there was a social dimension. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was with his Sahaba. So part of Ramadan is that Suhbah, being surrounded by people of like mind, people who elevate you, people who refine you spiritually in terms of your character. But part of it is making sure that you are gaining the inner dimension of that worship. So it's not a matter of just fasting, but that your fasting should not just be of food that there's also a fasting of the tongue. And part of fasting is fasting of the tongue. That there is a fasting of the eye. And that's part of fasting as well. There's the fasting of the ear, engaging all of the senses, engaging um, our mind, our spirit, and our ruh, our soul, as part of the fast as well. Now, in order to make that happen, it sounds very easy. It sounds very theoretical. It's like, okay, well, this is going to be the best fast. This is going to be the best Ramadan. Everybody approaches that. And when people have a great experience in, in the masjid, everybody has a great experience in the community center, then we say, oh, this is the best Ramadan ever. It was uplifting. It was inspiring. I feel uh, renewed. I feel a new sense of Iman. But in reality, that relationship is something which is uh, that we saw, as we mentioned last 
uh, Sunday, that relationship is direct between you and Allah. So others can facilitate that, but it requires you to approach the month of Ramadan with an open mind and more importantly, with an open heart in order for that to be achieved. So there are some practical pointers. There are some ideas and suggestions that are beneficial, inshallah. So I'm going to go through them and, and, and number them, inshallah, so we can stay organized. The first thing that's going to help us in the month of Ramadan is to compound the benefit. You know, Allah mentions about that, Inna Allah, min al Allah has purchased from the believers, right? Amwalahum wa anfusahum, their wealth and their lives, bi anna lahum al jannah, on account of their receiving al jannah. Right? And this, this transaction is described in the Quran as tijarat al lantabur. This is an investment that will never fail. Everybody wants to compound their returns. People invest in equity markets, they invest in stock markets because they want to increase their returns, but they want to increase it in multiples. They want to compound that as opposed to something that has a fixed yield. Right? So the idea is that you invest, you get your return, then you reinvest it. In the month of Ramadan, so, you know, look at people in, investing in cryptocurrency. I know a lot of people follow what's going on with Bitcoin and, um, you know, with a lot of the stocks that have been, uh, you know, happening over the last few months. And some of us should pause that even though there's this frenzy in the stock market, it should remind us, well, if this is the return that we get in the financial markets. What about the return that I receive from Allah? And there is a connection. Because Allah describes in the Quran, yasha. Allah multiplies for whomever he wills. Adha'afan, right? He does multiplies upon multiples, right? Everybody knows the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah about uh, how he multiplies in each ear of grain there are mi'atu habba. There are seven sab'a sanabil. There are seven ears of grain, and in each one there are a hundred seeds, right? And so everything gets multiplied a minimum of seven hundred times because after that Allah can multiply it as He wishes. Uh, one example of doing that is reported by Zayd ibn Khalid al Juhani. He narrated the Prophet ﷺ said, "Whoever gives a fasting person." food to break his or her fast. He, meaning or she, the one who is providing the food will get the reward equivalent to the fasting person's reward. Without diminishing anything from the reward of the fasting person. In another hadith is mentioned that this reward accrues the person who provides the food or the drink, even if it's ala tamra, even if it is a single day or a sip of milk, or even just the drink of water. So there are a lot of opportunities. So we should, I mean, the purpose of, of fasting is not necessarily or not primarily um, understanding the hardship and the difficulty of those who are hungry. <clears throat> but at the same time, you cannot help but, but understand and feel for people who, who are food insecure, who don't have enough to eat or who do not have enough nutritious food to eat when you are experiencing the fast. And so as a result, there is a special connection between the fast and food. And we find that connection in Zakat al-Fitr, right? So you fasted these 30 days, 29 days, and then at the end, in order for your fasting to be complete and for you to celebrate the day of Eid, the first thing that you have to do is to make sure that you have given a certain amount of grain, a certain amount of food that can be eaten to a deserving and to a poor person. Right? And the idea is that there are many needy people. Right? And mashallah, I'm so impressed by this community in particular how all of you have come together, not just devoting resources, but devoting time, energy, um, and attention to the plight of people 
who are hungry and the plight of people who don't have that food security. And we see that uh, within our community, within the surrounding community, Muslims coming together um, to take that spirit from the month of Ramadan and to, and to physically, uh, uh, and in a way that's very tangible, you know, assemble meals and deliver them to the people that are deserving and that, and that need it. Just imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so generous that without having to go through the fast, without having to put that time and energy or to have any hardship or difficulty, that you'll receive ajr is saim you'll receive the reward of the fasting person. I mean, that is a great promise and a great opportunity. So the first thing is compound the benefit. Get the benefit of your fast as well as the fast of others. The second aspect is invest in our youth. Many times we cater to our elders as we should with the khatiras, with the lectures, with the discussions, the halakas, and youth don't have an opportunity for their questions to be heard. It's very important for the youth not to get sidelined. And the way in which that's going to happen, inshallah, is by giving them their activities and programs. And inshallah, the community is going to be hearing about our Ramadan programming. We have uh, some youth events that are being planned. Um, and it's going to be an opportunity for, for our kids and for our teenagers to participate and to develop that connection with the masjid, with the center, right? One of the seven categories that the Prophet described as people who are provided for shade on a day in which there's no shade is shabu nashata ala ta'atillah, is a youth that grows up and is raised on the worship of Allah. Another one is rajulun is someone whose heart is attached to the place of worship, to the masjid. And so it's so important to inculcate that deep connection, that deep love in our younger generation for the center, to have that feeling of ta'alluq, that feeling of connection, that they really feel that this is our home and this is a place that we belong. The third aspect is be people of purpose. How you prioritize your time tells a lot about what's important to you. If you're the kind of person you go home and the first thing you think about is turning on the TV or entertainment, then that is a very physical way in which you're showing your priorities. If you're a person who, when you get home, the first thing that you do is you spend time with your spouse or you catch up and you go through the day, how was your day? What did you do? What's new? What's going on with this? That shows by, by not just by, by lip service, not just by acts, not just by speech, but rather through action that that person's preferences are important to you. Similarly, this is like the act of the fasting person. Normally every reward, every action has a specific reward. If you recite Alif Lam Mim, you will receive a reward for Alif. Lam has a reward and Mim has a reward. It's a fixed amount for each action that you do. If you pray, you receive a fixed reward for a specific reward for that action. And of course, Allah can multiply and everything good, ala ashari amthaliha. Everything is multiplied 10 times. But there are two things, my dear sisters and brothers, that have limitless reward. There are two things that have unlimited reward. The first example is the very famous one, which is that of patience. Allah says in the Quran, Innama yuwaffa sabiruna ajrahum hisab. Allah recompenses, Allah rewards, right? The patient ones, bighayri hisab, without any hisab, without any accounting. And so some of the scholars have said, well, why is it that patience has this limitless reward? And others, they said, because of the nature of patience itself is limitless. So you can't say, oh, well, I'm going to have this much patience and then I'm going to quote unquote, run out of patience. Well, patience by its nature is that it has to accommodate, it has to expand. And since patience itself is expanding, 
then the reward also has to be expansive. And so there's a limitless reward that comes for, for patients. Fasting is similar. The hadith that's related in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad is that fasting and the Quran will come and testify on behalf of the servant of Allah on the day of resurrection. Literally, they will be personified. They will be able to speak and to, to speak and to argue on our behalf. And fasting will say, oh my Lord, I denied him food and desires. So allow me as fasting. He needs, she needs to enter through Baba Rayyan, the door of the fasting people, that special door assigned for fasting people. Allow me to be the means that he, that she enters into paradise. Then the Quran will compete with fasting and say, oh my Lord, I denied him sleep at night. So allow me to be the means for which he enters paradise. And then the Prophet ﷺ described that he will ultimately enter into Jannah because of these two arguing on his behalf. So be people of purpose, have an idea, have that level of awareness. I think the, what, the perfect way to describe what I'm trying to express is be mindful in your fasting. I think in many cases, that level of attentiveness comes with awareness. So many of us, we know when we begin our salah, what's the first thing we do? We say, Allahu Akbar, and we begin our prayer. That is called takbir al-ihram, takbirat al-ihram. It's called ihram because whatever it was that we were doing before, it could have been completely permissible, it could have been fine. But now by saying Allahu Akbar, we're separating ourselves from that work meeting. We're separating ourselves from that mundane activity, from that housework that we were doing before. We say Allah is greater. There's an interruption in your day in order to perform the salah. And so now you're entering into a sacred space. You could be in the dressing room at the mall. You could be in a parking lot. You could be on a plane, but as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, you are spiritually transported into another world. And when you go for Hajj, you begin with the Talbiyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, here I am my Lord. Similarly, when you begin your fasting, you are entering a kind of state of Ihram. You're entering a state of as the state of the fasting person in which you're engaged in perpetual worship. Normally, if you read Quran, you'll re receive that reward. Fasting, your very being in a state of fasting itself is the worship. Even before you do anything extra, you are literally in the state of ibadah, of worship while you're fasting. <clears throat> the fifth aspect is it's an opportunity to draw closer to family. This is super, super important. I can't emphasize this enough. There are many people who are going to be waking up for their suhoor, for their sahri on their own. Everybody has an alarm clock, but then there are other people who don't even need to set their alarm because they know that when the time comes to eat, <clears throat> someone in their family, maybe mom, maybe dad, maybe a sibling, is going to wake them up and when they get up from their bed and they go to the dining table there's going to be a table set and full of delicious food we don't notice these beautiful expressions of love until we leave and we go off and live on our own or if allah causes us to be separated from our loved ones <clears throat> That opportunity of suhoor, just the fact of somebody waking you up <clears throat> or preparing something for you is so thoughtful and it's often taken for granted. Abu Hurairah he said, the Prophet ﷺ ascended the mimbar. So, you know, there was a, there was a woman from the, from the Sahabiyat, from the uh, female companions, and she donated the mimbar in the masjid and suggested that the Prophet would have that member with the, with the three steps. 
so that he would be able to stand on the first step and people would be able to see him and hear him more clearly. So on this occasion, he ascended the mimbar. So it, the, I mean, what's implied is that it wasn't Friday. So that itself was weird. And he said, Amin, Amin, Amin. Prophet said Amin three times. Then it was said, Ya Rasulullah, you ascended the mimbar, you said Amin three times. Then he said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and said, if Ramadan comes and a person is not forgiven, he will enter hell and Allah will cast him far away. Say Amin. So I said Amin. He said, oh Muhammad, if both or one of your parents are alive and he does not honor them and dies, he will enter hell. Allah will cast him far away. Say Amin. So I said Amin. He said, if you are mentioned in a person's, person's presence and he does not send salawat blessings on you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he dies, he will enter hell and Allah will cast him far away. Say Amin. So I said Amin. I can't emphasize this enough. The month of Ramadan is a great opportunity for us to express our love and appreciation for our parents and for parents to express their love and attentiveness and appreciation for their children. Some people think that bir al-walidain, righteousness and goodness to, and kindness to parents is just a matter of obedience. But it requires much more. Allah says in the Quran, wala taqul lahuma uf. Do not even utter uf as an expression of your displeasure towards your parents. One of the mufassirin, one of the great scholars, he said, if Allah knew of an utterance lesser than uf, he would have mentioned it. The only reason Allah mentioned uf is because this is the lowest verbal expression of displeasure that someone can, can utter um, based on a request of the parents. So bitter al-walidin, being good with your parents, doesn't just require you to obey those things which are not harmful to you, right? And which you can do without um, any hardship, right? There are exceptions in which, uh, in most cases, you'll, you'll uh, respect the wishes of your parents, but not in every case. That's very important. Um, but, to, but to also do it with love and to do it with kindness is very important. The sixth aspect is to connect with the masjid. <clears throat> Online, there are a lot of Ramadan planters, uh, planners. I, I strongly recommend print out one of those planners. It's a great way to organize, track your prayers, track your recitation of the Quran, track your remembrance of Allah. Come up with an agenda that this month of Ramadan, I'm going to read the whole Quran cover to cover. But not only am I going to recite it in, in Arabic, I'm also going to read it with the meaning and the translation. Or I'm also going to read it with the commentary. I'm going to engage in this reflection this month of Ramadan. The seventh tip is breaking bad habits. The month of Ramadan, as uh, Imam al-Ghazali said, that this is about kasr shahawat right? An-nafs alladhi bayna jambayk. So part of it is that this is a spiritual training for the soul. And for the nafs, and nafs al mulhama, the nafs which is in one one side, fujuraha wa taqwaha, which is being tempted to be the lesser version of ourselves, and then the other side of the nafs which is trying to be better. But the knowledge that we talked about last Sunday was sufi that is shayatin, knowing that shaitan is locked up. Now you have more confidence that I can attain mastery over myself. I can break those desires. Part of that is muhasaba. Part of that is just introspection. You know, I'm good at this, but I'm not so good at that. I've been doing well on this account, but I need to give this more attention. Engaging in that process, not only, and people should do that with their careers too. Many people continue with their career. They don't examine their strengths and their weaknesses. Right? The first time they think about any weakness is if they're in an interview and somebody says, well, describe your greatest weakness. And then, you know, we're all trained to describe a weakness that's not really, I'm too detail oriented, right? Or something that's not really a weakness. Part of the muhasaba that Umar uh, recommended was for us to actually implement the cure for that and to address that problem 
before it festers. So a couple more. Eight, give from the heart. Allah describes in Surah Al-Hashr the ithar, the preferring others. The Prophet said, Tahadu tahabu. Exchange gifts with each other and you will increase in mutual affection. One of the things that my wife likes to do in the month of Ramadan is she has the, uh, a, a little bit of a cubby system for 30 days. And in each pocket are small gifts that the kids receive every night for the month of Ramadan. And so throughout the year, there's this feeling of anticipation that the month of Ramadan is coming. You know, yes, it's nice. Everybody likes to get Eid. Okay, we got some money on, 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 you know, on Eid. But it, it's devoid of any thought. And if you can create those decorations in the home, create that level of excitement, let the kids do calligraphy, let the kids put together decorations, and create a festive environment, then the month of Ramadan is going to be a time of joy. And definitely, if you can start thinking about Eid and how you're going to celebrate and make it special for our children, especially when there's, by and large, they're surrounded by their friends and their classmates who aren't Muslim. And for them to be in a position in which they can talk to their friends and their classmates. Well, this is what I got for Eid. And this is a special celebration. This is why it's special to me. This is part of the prophetic example. Give from the heart. Have those you know, thoughtful messages ready for your kids. So that way Ramadan is special. The ninth uh, tip is invite people to Islam. We don't have time for the whole story, but there was a man that came to Ibn Abbas when he was in Irtikaf and he asked him for assistance. And Ibn Abbas, without any hesitation, he picked up and he left the masjid. And the people around him, they said, whoa, you're in Irtikaf. You're supposed to be secluded in the masjid. Where are you going? He said, fulfilling the need of my brother is more beloved to me than performing Irtikaf, being in seclusion for two months in the masjid, in the masjid of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So many of us, we think that if we ignore everyone and we hide ourselves, right? That that is going to be the most meaningful worship. That's not true. What about the mother that's nursing her baby, her newborn baby in the month of Ramadan? You can, what, what about the person that has to prepare food? What about the person who works in the hospital, who's on call? Everybody has different situations in the month of Ramadan. When you're walking to an appointment, you're in dhikrillah, you're in remembrance of Allah. When you're driving a car, you are in a state of worship. So don't wait for those opportunities. Make that mindfulness something that you do throughout the month of Ramadan. And then the last thing that I'll mention is the home halaqa. Yes, we have the khatras. Yes, we have beautiful recitation of Quran. Yes, we have taraweeh. All of this is prepared for your benefit. But the Prophet ﷺ also told us, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم مقابة. Don't make your homes a place that is dead. Don't make it a place that is bereft of worship. That sunnah has to happen at home. The Prophet ﷺ, his habit was to perform sunnah in his house and he would perform the fard prayers in the masjid. How many of us have a home gathering where we spend a few minutes reciting a verse reciting a hadith, picking one of the kids, or between even a husband and a wife, or whoever, or, or parents and a child, reading a story of the Sahaba together. Make those times special. Allocate a time within the day in which you give your children an activity. Let them run it. Let them take the lead. Have them prepare some artwork, post it in the house, decorate the homes. When Allah described the month of Ramadan, He said, ayyaman ma'adudat. These are limited number of days. And with the awareness that we only have a few days in the month of Ramadan, it does require some planning. It's a blessed time, but in order for us to really achieve the benefits of the month of Ramadan, it requires us to have a time management plan 
and to approach it very pragmatically that this month of Ramadan, I'm going to be focused on these things and these are the things that I'm going to work on. So I hope and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us in this month of Ramadan. He allows us to reach it in a good state of health, good state of wealth, and most importantly, in the highest spirits and the best state of Iman, and that we can truly achieve everything that this great month has to offer. Most importantly, Allah's acceptance, Allah's satisfaction with us, and that our fasting, and that our prayers, and our du'as, our supplications, are all accepted, uh, inshallah. Uh, at this point, it's a good opportunity for us to uh, take some questions, have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, so everybody's uh, invited uh, one at a time to, to uh, offer their question. Thank you, uh, brother. Uh, Rifai, uh, my question is for a person who is sick and uh, unable to fast, um, what should he or she do? Okay, this is a, this is a great question. Um, and it's actually addressed in the same verse that we mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, right? So as soon as Allah describes that fasting is prescribed, the very next part of the verse is, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا So if there is someone who is sick, أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ Or traveling, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَى Then that person should make up the days later. And it's very important before we proceed to understand that there are two kinds of sickness. Right? So there, are, there is a sickness which is temporary in nature, and there's another one which is chronic. So if a person has a temporary sickness, then that person will make up those days later. It is recommended that they should do it at any time uh, after the month of Ramadan, right? And many people do it during the time in which the days are short. There's no shame in that. Yassiru wa la tu'asiru, right? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, make things easy, don't make them difficult. In fact, there's a hadith from Aisha, anha. she described how, especially because the ladies, usually they have more days to make up. So she would describe how they would make up the, the days, usually way in advance of the month of Ramadan. But then in, in one occasion, they rushed, and she rushed to perform those days in the month of, of Sha'aban, which is a proof that, yes, it's good to, to make them up right away, but there's no harm in waiting until right before the month of Ramadan, it's recommended not to wait beyond the next month of Ramadan, right? So that's for a temporary sickness. But then there are some people, especially because of diabetes or uh, because of, of, of some weakness and there are some who are recovering from COVID, there are lots of other cases in which uh, there is the possibility that the person will not be able to make up those days. So for the person that has a chronic condition, then they give the fidya. So that person will provide a meal for, uh, for a needy person. And that will be a full expiation for their, for their fasting. And I know that a lot of people have this feeling of guilt, like I took the easy way out. I, I know some people who, when they're traveling, they don't shorten their prayers. I don't know if anybody has experienced that. You know, we have some, some people who are like, oh, I want to do extra. It's like the, the same person that prays all night in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. They don't sleep. They're drowsy. I'm like, please, brother, like, don't drive. You know, you're not in any condition. And the reality is that that kind of excessiveness is, is, is harmful. And the reason for that is Allah has given you a rukhsa. Allah has given you a license and permission and has made things easy for you. And it's very, very important you should take that approval. If Allah is making things easy for you, then who are you when the king of all kings has given you the green light to say, no, I'm going to make it hard on myself. So it's very important for the person who's, who's fasting, who has a medical condition, that person should not fast. It is a medical determination. 
not a religious determination because the religious guidance is very, very clear, which is that if you can do it without any risk to yourself in a safe way, then you should fast. If there is a risk of harm, and that's a medical determination to be decided by your physician, that if there is a risk of harm, then the person should avoid it. It doesn't, you don't have to wait until you're actually harmed. If you know that there is a ascertainable, there is a clear medical risk, then the person should avoid fasting. And then they can give in the fedia, they can give to the poor person uh, as, a, as, as, a, as an expiation for that fast. And they never have to think about performing those days again, because that is a, that will be a full expiation for their, for their fasting, inshallah. So uh, I see also there are a couple of questions in the chat. Should I address those? Yes, sure. Okay, so Sister Zamruda is asking, uh, is it compulsory to eat suhoor? Can we only drink a glass of water and fast? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Sahiru, eat suhoor. He strongly recommended it in his hadith. But it's very important. Sometimes in some hadith, the Prophet ﷺ will command us to do something and it will be in order. And in other cases, it's the Prophet ﷺ giving us advice. So here when the Prophet ﷺ says, eat suhoor, he is expressing to us that suhoor is his sunnah. It's not mandatory, right? And in another hadith he mentions, and he says, فَإِنَّ فِي السُحُورِ baraka," Because there's a lot of blessing and there's a lot of benefit to having a small meal before fasting. Uh, in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said to drink even a glass of water for suhoor. And this indicates from a medical perspective, the importance of staying hydrated. Right? So part of it is, uh, is just because of, I mean, there's an effect on your breath, there's an effect on your uh, digestion, um, but also there's a need for you to stay hydrated through the day. So uh, drinking that water in the time of suhoor is, is really important, but it is not a precondition for the fast. It does not enter into, it's an independent action from the fasting itself. The fasting is from dawn until dusk. And then the suhoor is a, is a separate, it's a different, it's a different sunnah, right? So it's something that you should do, but it's not required. And that's important because on many occasions we'll set our alarm, we might sleep through the time of suhoor and we're able to pray fajr. And now we say, well, well what do I do? I, I, I missed out on suhoor. And in fact, you know, it's not required, even though it's a sunnah and, 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 it's, and it's perfectly fine. And then Shanaz is asking, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Increasing khushu and taqwa as we prepare for Ramadan, can we combine one niyas for multiple types of salah and all your sunnah salah are just some sunnah salah only? So these are great questions. For increasing khushu and taqwa, um, I would say, you know, we heard some of the tips uh, some of the pointers that I mentioned, but I think having that Ramadan planner, it sounds nerdy, it sounds cliche, but if you take a piece of paper, even a journal entry, and you write down what you're going to do the month of Ramadan, every time you change your routine, there's a, there's a, a longitudinal study um, that was performed um, at least a decade ago about uh, they had a large uh, study sample and they tried to, I think it had to do with brushing teeth or it was something else uh, in the house. And they found that it took a minimum of 11 days before people would change their habits. So in the beginning, you're trying to introduce a new routine and we're just mentally, we're just resistant to that. And so what you really have to do is, you know, reinforce that. So by writing that down and by approaching that khushu, for example, one of the Sahaba, he said, when I enter, people notice that his salah is like amazing. He's like entering into a different zone. And so his companions, they asked, uh, this is from the time of the Tabi'een. They said, well, what do you do? He said, when I say Allahu Akbar, I imagine that Jannah is in front of me. I imagine that the hellfire is behind me. I imagine that I'm over a sirat, over that, bridge of the Sirat. I imagine that there's fire and, and X, Y, and Z. And he continued to describe in these very, very detailed description 
uh, how he would engage in visualization. That's what we would call it in today's terms, right? So he would visualize that situation and that would allow him to have khushur in his salah. Not everybody's visual. Other people need to do something different. But the important thing is that before you take that action, first enter that mental space, right? Prepare yourself before you actually do that. In terms of combining the niyas, the intention. So according to Imam Shafi'i, right? And according to the majority of the scholars, it is uh, absolutely permissible to combine intentions, right? Uh, for a salah which is not obligatory. Uh, some people make the mistake of trying to combine a prayer which is obligatory. A fourth prayer is mandatory. So because you have to do that prayer, you are precluded from combining that with any other intention. Because you, in, in addition to the reward that you're gonna get, you're also discharging that obligation. So think check mark, okay, I performed the prayer, right? And that is the, also the case, even if you're making up the prayer, you cannot combine any other niyyah. However, when it is a prayer which is not obligatory or a sunnah prayer, then you can combine. So for example, let's say you enter the masjid. So normally there's tahiyat al-masjid for breeding the masjid. There's two you know, units of prayer that you can say as entering for entering the masjid. Also, you just perform wudu. So there's sunnah al-wudu. There's two units of prayer for performing wudu. And the mu'adhin just call the adhan. As the Prophet ﷺ said, بَيْنَ كُلَّ أَذَانَيْنْ صَلَةً There is a prayer between every two adhans, meaning the adhan and the iqama. So now you're thinking, okay, which one should I choose? Should I choose tahayt al-masjid, wudu, or the sunnah after the adhan? Or should I perform all six? And the solution is, you can pray just two and with all three intentions and you will receive the reward of all three prayers. You will re receive the reward of the six rak'at inshallah. So the answer to the question is yes, you can combine the niyyah for multiple uh, types of salah, um, but you should not mix anything with the mandatory prayer. Brother Shokat, assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, also, we have another question. At what age should we encourage our children to experience fasting? And at what age is it compulsory on them to fast? So I'll, I'll do it in inverse, inverse order. So the, the age in which it's mandatory is the age of puberty, right? And in some cases, you know, uh, you know the, the signs are not as clear, uh, but usually you can tell. Uh, especially parents are usually usually aware. So the age of majority happens when the person enters into adulthood. However, you don't want a situation in which your child suddenly is being told, well, now you need to fast. Well, now you need to pray five times a day. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he told us, command your children to pray, right? So there are some things which we teach them, there are some things that we show them, and then there are other things that we tell them. Salah is one of those things where we tell them. And the earlier that we can tell our kids that they should pray, the better, right? The Prophet said, he mentions to introduce that at the age of seven, right? And then again, he reinforces that at the age of 10. With fasting, what I suggest is for the younger kids is that they can do half of a day of fast. Right? And that allows them to participate in suhoor or participate in iftar and to feel like they're, they're fasting just the way that the grown-ups are. And it's something naturally. Kids just love being a part of the action. They want to be part of that, that fast. Um, and so you can do it gradually. And then I think most kids by the age of around, of around 10, they are, or maybe even sooner, are able to complete the full fast. And also you have to kind of engage in that conversation. It's the same thing um, with everything that you do with your kids. You have to engage in this conversation. So it's not like, oh, you're this age. Now you have to wear these clothes. Okay, you're this age. Now you need to pray suddenly. No, it should be an open conversation that starts from a young age 
So that way they're mentally ready and it's something that they want themselves. So it's not something that's being imposed top down, but it's, it's the result of discussions that have been in the process you know, for many, many years. Um, Brother Shokat, um, uh, a common argument, do we fast or not fast due to a medical reason? Um, I usually think that the best answer to this is to defer to the medical experts. Once you explain to them that we're fasting from these hours, it's an intermittent fast, right? We're going to hydrate throughout the evening. We're gonna drink X number of glasses of water. Um, but during this period, we won't be eating and drinking. For somebody who's, who, uh, who is not able to manage their glucose level, for example, somebody who's uh, diabetic, and in every case is different, maybe the length of the fast is going to be too onerous, that they shouldn't attempt to fast at all. In another case, the doctor might say, go ahead and fast, but monitor your sugar levels. In that case, the person will fast and then break the fast if they're experiencing any hardship. Similarly, somebody might be uh, having a cold. And so yes, they're sick. They can use that as a reason, but they wanna try. Or they're on a journey and they're traveling, they wanna try. So they attempt that fast. And then if the person is feeling so bad, they're not able to complete the fast, they can break that fast at that point. So even though they entered the, the, the fast because they were able, the circumstance changed, so the hukum changed, right? So the ruling also changed. So now it's allowed for them to break that fast and then they'll make up the day on a different occasion. And maybe there are some people who will be able to make it up in the time of the year when the fast is, is earlier, when it's four or 4.30. Whereas for other people, they won't be able to make it up at all. And they're going to give the food to the needy people, to the fidya. If someone is very old, can they feed people? Uh, yes and no. So the disposition is not based on age. There are many, many uh, people in our community who are in their 70s, and they are in far better health than our youth. And then there are other people who, uh, you know, old age has, has caused some medical conditions. And so it's truly a medical determination, right? As to whether the person is able to engage in fasting um, or whether they should take that disposition. So there is no automatic cutoff that, well, you reach this age, so therefore now you don't, you don't have to fast. But I do think that the, the rules and requirements are a lot more flexible than what people realize. Our deen, after Allah mentioned all of these verses about fasting, what does he say? Yuridullahu bikumul yusr. Allah wants to make things easy for you. Wala yuridu bikumul arsul. And he doesn't want any hardship on you. Wali took midul idda. And in order for you to complete that prescribed period, wali took abdullah ala mahadakum and for you to declare that Allah is the greatest and to say takbir on account of his guiding you. So hopefully uh, that's beneficial, inshallah. Uh, Brother Shahzad, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam to Allah. Uh, fidya for our deceased parents. So if anyone has deceased parents or family me members who owe fast, this is an extremely important question. I'm very grateful that was mentioned. It falls, it was fidya for them, but it remains unpaid fidya. So it's basically like a kind of kafar. It's a kind of expiation. So that fidya actually was supposed to be paid immediately upon their passing, as soon as possible. And it should be paid from the estate of the deceased. If the person leaves property behind, then there we call it a religious obligation, right? So for example, a hajj that wasn't performed, a fidya that wasn't paid, a kafara that is o and doing. So that should come from the estate of the deceased person. If that didn't happen before distribution, if that doesn't happen, then it will fall on the family members, uh, especially the children to make sure that that should be, that should be offered. So if it has not uh, taken place, then I would encourage you to go ahead 
uh, and do that as quickly as possible. And inshallah, you'll be rewarded as well as your deceased parents will be rewarded for fulfilling that obligation. All right, are there any other questions before we conclude? Alhamdulillah, that's good. We're, we're still Yes, wa alaikum One last question, I'm so sorry. Sure. I was um, out of curiosity, what's the recommended amount of people to feed? So in this case, this is, this is for the person that has a medical ruhsa, a medical excuse is different from the example of the person who intentionally breaks their fast, which we haven't had a discussion about. So that is Sitina Miskina, that person who has intentionally broken their fast, they need to fast for two months consecutively, or they can give to 60 poor people. But in the case of a person who's doing it for a medical reason, it's actually very simple. Fa'amu Miskin. So you just have to give food for the needy person, right? So you're going to, if it's 30 days, so you're giving 30 fasts, you have 30 meals. Um, and it should be, you know, it should be according to the meals of, you know, that you are used to using based on your standard of living. So for, for most people, it would be under $10 if you're going to <clears throat> donate it. What I recommend is to give to an Islamic organization that collects funds for that purpose. And the reason is because then you can ensure that the food, you'll give it in the form of money because the sunnah is that you're not supposed to give it as money. It's supposed to be an actual meal provided to the needy person. But Alhamdulillah, we have Islamic organizations that were collected in the form of funds. And then they will make the arrangements to feed the needy person. And so you have that peace of mind that my fidya is being performed uh, the right way. Um, and then uh, I think Sister Sunda has a question. I see her hand is up. Yes, please. I think you're muted. Yes, good idea to unmute. So um, thank you very much for a very nice uh, halaqa. And my question is unrelated to, to Ramadan, but related to Salah and what you said about So when you're traveling and you're allowed to do um, the jama and the salat, um, how long can you do that? And can you do it jama and taqsir or just jama and taqdim? What's your understanding of that? And what's your um, explanation of that, please? Thank you. So inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll explore it in a very superficial way and we can go in more detail in the future inshallah because it's, it's a point in which there's difference of opinion. Um, so for example, uh, on this issue, I mostly follow the view of Imam Hanifa, which is that a person can remain as a musafir in the state of being a traveler for up to 15 days, right? As long as that person knows that the journey is not going to be longer than that. So you, so for example, if I travel to Texas and I'm there for 10 days, I will actually be, be praying as a musafir while I'm on the journey and while I'm at my destination for the full period of the 10 days because my, my travel has a discrete um, departure and, and return. And so because I know when I'm coming back, on another occasion, I might go to Texas and I'm waiting for a phone call. Once I get that phone call, I'm gonna go back home. I might end up in Texas for months and continuing to pray as a musafir, as a traveler. And the reason is because I'm constantly in a state of anticipation, I might have to leave, right? And this is also the view of the other scholars, but they don't agree with the 15 days. So for Imam Shafi'i, for example, it's gonna be only three days, right? And during that period in which you're a traveler, you're a musafir, you're able to shorten the prayers. In fact, you should shorten the prayers, as we mentioned before, because Allah has given you that license to make things easy. So you can pray other sunnah prayers, but if you want to do the full form of the prayer, four units, for example, it's permissible, but you actually will receive less reward. And that confuses us. How is it possible? I'll get less reward if I do four instead of two. Yes. It's more rewarded to take that opportunity that Allah gives you. 
And during that period, according to the, the majority of the scholars, except for the Hanafi scholars, you are able to combine the prayers. So Dhuhr and Asr, they will be prayed together. And Maghrib and Aisha, I'm sorry, uh, Maghrib and Aisha, they will be performed together, right? A, a, a combined jama'ah, as you mentioned. Um, uh, Imam Hanifa, uh, I don't follow him on this point, but, uh, but the classical Hanafi view is that the Prophet ﷺ combined prayers only for other reasons, not just because of traveling. And so therefore they don't, they don't do the jama'ah. For the other scholars, which is the stronger view, you will perform the taqsir, you'll, you'll, you'll shorten the prayers, and you'll also combine the prayers for the entire period in which you're traveling. And so really the only thing left that we have, and I think this is the right opinion, the only thing that, that's left to determine is what's the right number of days and what's the correct amount of distance. And that's something we can, we can explore, inshallah, in the future. Does that answer? Okay, yeah. thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. And then um, there's also another question. Um, can we do sadaqa acts for deceased that you are not related to? So this is also another major topic that inshallah we can, we can touch upon, um, but we'll have to save the full discussion later. This is the idea of isal al-thawab. Can you do perform acts on behalf of another person? So conceptually, it usually comes up when the person is deceased. But in reality, conceptually, there's no difference. The theoretical issue is that, isn't it that each person, nobody takes the blame or the sin of the other person? So how is it possible that I can do an action and others would be rewarded for it? As the Prophet said, um, he said, when somebody passes away uh, from the children of Adam, all of her actions, all of his actions come to an end, except for three things. And the three things that are mentioned, right, are waladun salihun yad'ula, a righteous child who supplicates on behalf of the parent, right? Or actually, I got the order wrong. The first one is sadaqatun jariya, right? is a perpetual charity, right? Uh, like a well, for example, donation to the masjid, something that people continue to benefit from. Or or some knowledge that others are benefiting from. Or or a righteous child who supplicates on behalf of the parent. So the point that I wanna uh, you know, give attention to is that when you die, your deeds end, but your legacy continues. And so what you want to do is you want to invest in actions that continue to reap rewards and benefits later on. And the most valuable uh, thing that you can do is invest in the next generation. Because a parent is not rewarded directly for the acts of their child. And similarly, a parent is not punished for the acts of their child directly. But if your children <clears throat> do good deeds because of your tarbiya, because of the upbringing they receive from you, because of the values that you taught them, then yes, you're going to receive that reward. Most of the scholars, they disagreed with Isal al-Thawab. They said that once a person is deceased, um, then in reality, <clears throat> you're reciting Quran, you're making dua, just so, uh, to make your supplication on behalf of the deceased more readily accepted by Allah. But I, as a, I, you know, I'm not in a position to dictate to Allah how those acts should be allocated. So I can't say, oh Allah, I read a few juz of the Quran, give that reward to so-and-so. I can ask, we hope, we pray Allah will accept that request, but it should not be presumed that I can dictate that my sadaqa acts are going to be allocated on the scale of another person. So generally this is considered the most sound opinion, but there's room for difference of opinion. There's room for other views, you know, as well in the Sharia. Um, and so there, there's a little bit of a difference of opinion, but I think this is the safest view, which is that it is possible, but only if Allah allows that request to be granted then it becomes possible, inshallah. Well, Darth, can I have, can I have a, just one minute? Please. 
uh, I actually had uh, diabetes uh, after um, maybe 10 or oh, nine years back. And I had, I used to take, and then I got the cardiac issues also. And I take uh, six pills every day. And when I was fasting, I didn't stop fasting actually. Uh, I feel much better than the regular days actually. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you... Uh, Okay, so, uh, you know, I have to be cautious as Imam, you know, because I am cognizant that people, they take, uh, they will take my advice. And in some cases, that advice will be very good. And in other cases, might not be the right advice, right? There was a person that had an injury from the Sahaba, and he had a head injury, it was an open wound, right? So we know how dangerous that is. And he was in a state of Janaba, he needed to do a bath, a ghusl in order to, to pray. And so he asked his friends that, well, do I need to perform the ghusl and wash? And they said, yes, you can pray. Go take a bath. And he has an open head wound. He did so, and he ended up dying as a result. Uh -huh. And the companions, they came to the Prophet wasallam and described what had taken place. The Prophet him visually, he became red in his face. And he described how upset he was. And he said, they killed him by, by, by making that statement. And that shows as an example to us the importance that we shouldn't just say things, right? We should be very mindful of what we say. And so because of that, I'm very reluctant to say that um, people who are advised not to fast should do it anyway. But you're definitely right that for people who have high glucose levels, right? the intermittent fasting is going to definitely be beneficial for the vast majority of people. It allows you to detox. It allows our digestive system to get a break. It allows our body to regulate, remove toxins. I mean, the benefits go on and on, right? Uh, in terms of, of fasting, especially the way that we do it in Islam. But there are people who have a danger of their sugar levels dropping too low. So if a person has a glucose level, which is, which is high, and then they fast, so it drops, now they're in the normal range, right? And then you have a person who's uh, before fasting is in the normal range, and then they fast, so now it's, it's below normal. And that could be very dangerous, right? The person could end up in the hospital as a result. And so I think it's very important. I should be very cautious and and, and leave that determination to the physician. But what we know anecdotally, as, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is that you know, the vast majority of people throughout the Muslim world, they fast with diabetes uh, and other medical conditions and they don't experience any dangers as a result. And that's really gonna depend on the person, inshallah. And also how you manage it. That requires more skill. It requires you to eat throughout the evening in a gradual way. You know, not having a very, very heavy iftar where you have a sudden sugar spike, making sure that you have suhoor, eating certain foods, you know, that, that, uh, that have fiber or that are where the sugar is gonna be released over time. These are things that a person, you know, the Prophet he said in one hadith, he said that you should be capable don't be incapable. So the believer is a person who's proactive. Go research, find out, you know, what should I do? What should I not do? Get all of the information, right? That is going to enable you, you know, to have a successful fast, inshallah. But this is excellent advice from Brother Shamin that we should, you know, uh, we shouldn't just dismiss that, oh, I, I, I can fast. In many cases, it, it is possible to do. It's a very inspiring uh, message for sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brother Mohsen, uh, should we take any yes. more questions? Yes, thank you. That's it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So may Allah accept from all of us. I uh, hope you have a wonderful Sunday morning. And inshallah, I'll be uh, in Maryland in another week. So I ask all of you to pray for us uh, as well and that we have a, a successful month of Ramadan. And uh, inshallah, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in person.